Snafu is a podcast that contains adult themes and language. Listener discretion is advised. Hey guys, welcome to Snap Food, where the situation's normal, all fucked up. This is the podcast where we tell you stories of true crime, true mystery, and the truly fucked up shit that happens every single day that we've all just seemed to have forgotten about. So we decided we wanted to remind you. I'm Shannon, and this week I am all by myself. Corey is gone, uh, but he's moving to an island and so am I. So don't worry, if you like him more, that's okay. He's, he's going to come back soon enough. It's just... We are literally in the process of moving, and we want to get these episodes out anyways, any way that we can, so, you know, a few maybe solo is all, and this time you guys get me. But seriously, thank you for stopping by and giving us a listen. I'm really glad you guys are here, because today is going to get spooky, and there's nothing like telling a scary story alone in the dark to make you want to abandon this place and literally just go turn into a blanket burrito at my neighbor's, so, you know, but now you're here, so it's going to be okay. And because I'm on my own this episode, you all know I get to do things a little bit differently. And that means I get to pick the theme, the story, and I definitely get to pick the drink. (laughs) Ha ha, Corey. So guys, go on, sit on back, and try and relax, because I'm going to take us to a dark little corner just outside of New Orleans, and it's filled with dark water, gators, and some voodoo magic. All right, so this week I'm going to tell you the tale of the voodoo queen whose path you probably shouldn't cross, and it's probably not even the person that you're thinking about, because today we're going to be discussing Aunt Julia Brown. That being said, uh, in order to get into the mood, I went ahead and decided to put us together a little drink that wasn't just my normal blood red wine. Nope, instead today we're going to be drinking the voodoo queen cocktail, and I found this, it's designed by Jessica A. on the blog Circa A Vintage Life. And guys, it is so good, and especially when it's this hot. I made it yesterday just to prep and made some for tonight in order to do this recording. And yeah, I'm going to certify it Shannon approved. There you go. So this is what you're going to need to do. So it's super easy. It just takes one longer step than I kind of wished. But here we go with the ingredients. It's sage leaves, one cup sugar, one cup water, three to four blackberries, Yes, we're going to get dark on this drink. And uh, 1.5 ounces of rum and one lime wedge, tonic water, and ice. So this is what you'll need to do. So go ahead and take a cup of water and the cup of sugar and put it in a saucepan over medium heat on the stovetop. And get that nice and beautiful sugary crystals all dissolved into the water. You know what I'm talking about. And then once that's nice and dissolved and it looks just like regular water, you remove it from the heat and you put the sage leaves in and then you're just going to let them steep for about an hour. This is going to cause a sage syrup. To me, it actually seemed like a little bit too much sugar. So if you're a little conscious of that, you can even pull back on that. And I'm not normally one to say that there's too much sugar in anything. So, you know, take that for what it is. So when you get all this done, you go ahead and get yourself a glass. Inside, you're going to add that juice from the lime wedge, your three to four berries, and 0.75 ounces of this sage syrup that we've been making. And you're just going to muddle that all together until it's good and you're pretty satisfied with how it looks. I even took out some of the pulp because I didn't really care for that to be in there. So then you toss in some crushed ice. For me, I am not so fancy, so I got a heck of a lot of cubes, but that's fine. And then on top of that, you finally add your rum and a wee bit of tonic water just to spritzing, give it a good stir, and then just top it off with some more blackberries or sage, whatever, you know, your witchy self is feeling. And voila, you have a beautifully dark drink suitable for the New Orleans heat. And what could be more exciting? Like I said, I'm drinking this tonight, and I think it's really, really good, but I actually also learned any, the only thing I had in my house rum-wise was spiced rum. And I still think it's good, but it kind of takes away from the very earthiness of the drink. Is it a little bit more of a kick? If that's your thing, definitely try it. I think it's good. But if you got regular rum that's not spice, then it's it's just as good on its own. Like this drink is fantastic. So I'm super glad that we're getting a little themed out for this. I mean, I think I'm just a little too excited for Halloween to go ahead and get here. And I don't know if I can wait two months. So here we are. We're diving straight into the voodoo theme. 
And what could be more exciting than, you know, a spooky story to go with it? So then here we go. Now, if you're going to talk about American Voodoo Queen, there's truly no other city that we can mention than New Orleans. And this is Julia Bernard's stomping grounds because Bernard is her maiden name, according to the Mental Floss article that I read about Julia. And it claims that Julia was born in 1845 in Gentilly, New Orleans. So it's a very diverse section of town on the edge of New Orleans. You know, it's kind of bordering over Lake Pontichamp. Now, we know Julia was black because her obituary says so. However, there's really no telling how accurate this is. Marie Laveau herself was black, white, and Native American. And many people in New Orleans at this time were mixed racially. In fact, this whole area was owned by the French only 40 years prior to her birth. So this major port city is truly just a real melting pot of religions and cultures and languages. And so generally, New Orleans would be a lot more fluid than the rest of the United States at this time. They're literally running almost off different laws. How they treat their slaves is different. The way that women could even own property is different. So, you know, this this area is known for people interacting a lot more and a lot more things kind of just being acceptable. But don't don't think that this was a fun place, especially for a black woman before the end of slavery. The thing is, is I can't tell what she was because Julia is in New Orleans and there's no sign that she is a slave. But Julia definitely does end up becoming involved in the study of voodoo. And she would most likely have been kicking around Congo Square around the same years that Marie Laveau and her daughters would have been practicing there. So what is voodoo? Well, in Julia's case, we really have to look at Louisiana voodoo in particular as voodoo can be varied in a lot of different areas. But really, voodoo is a spiritual belief that is built on a combination of West African-based beliefs, mainly Dahomenian voodoo, uh, that was really heavily ancestor-based, and as well as the Catholic religion. So this really came together thanks to dun, 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 the slave trade. You know, you got big swaths of African people being enslaved and forced to migrate to the Americas. In the process, they're going to be forced to learn to understand and accept the Christian religion of their masters. And as I've stated before, this this entire area was owned by the French, who were Catholic, just like the Spanish, who were also conquering the Bahamas and the South America. Catholic. So... Why would voodoo kind of grow up in that area more than it would have in the northern states of the United States? Because Catholicism might have not been the more mandated religion up in, say, North Carolina or Virginia or New York. But it was in the Bahamas and Louisiana and Haiti and Cuba. So that's where you kind of get this mix of, like, voodoo into Catholicism and an end they really go in hand in hand. So there's many examples on how this religion was interwoven. So in voodoo, it's common to have amulets and charms and protection necklaces. In fact, I always get a new grigri just about once every year if I can make it to New Orleans. And a lot of these charms could be for protection or for harm. It's it's to keep you safe from people harming you or you know, not let you get poisoned, or here's good luck, or maybe you're just trying to turn things around for yourself and make more money. You know, it's it's things that are as simple as that. This is very similar to the West African beliefs, and it's a lot like what we talked about in episode six when we discussed African witch doctors. So these items may have, you know, little bits and pieces of in them from nails or bones or even a few different kinds of herbs or just an assortment of items, and yet It would require like a casting of a spell or a ritual to place this power into these items. And the part where the Catholic religion pops in is we also know that Catholics carry around symbols and charms. You would most likely call them like a saint's charm or a saint's like pendant. And while you're casting these spells to make this particular voodoo charm, you could be calling on Jehovah or Jesus Christ or saints. You know, they're often invoked right alongside the Voodoo Loas. So the same spirits that can almost be accounted in the same way that you would look at Catholic saints. 
except for you can outright pray and call on these Catholic saints, you know, St. Michael, would you come protect me? But when it comes to the Loa, each one has actually a distinct sacred music, dance, and a kind of attendance. So in voodoo, what the practitioner is really doing is calling on the spirit of this Loa to invoke a possession over themselves, and they all come in different manners. The way you know that is that particular spirit is they might, you know, show up in your eyes with a different color. Maybe you'll start seeping black out of your mouth. Like, they all have their own independent signs. So it's important to note that the slave community here in New Orleans and in Louisiana had more freedom to practice their spiritual beliefs, unlike slaves in other areas such as the northern states or Haiti. And Haiti became distinct because the Haitian Revolution from 1791 to 1804 was actually started by slaves who said that they were possessed by a loa, and the result of this major fight against slavery was that, well, many slavers began an active effort into suppressing the voodoo religion and practice. So essentially, these guys had a, a great revolution that actually worked, and when it came down to their reason why, they said their religion, and that scared the hell out of some white men. So they were like, well, congregation, allowing them to have their own religion, this doesn't work out so well. But like we said, in New Orleans, things were a little bit different. Actually, some of the lower, lower southern states had more of a, a habit of not separating children from their families until a certain age. Um, so a lot of this grouping was more connected. They'd spent more time with each other. They weren't separated by long distances from each other the moment that they hit land. And in doing so, they managed to maintain more of their culture and their religion and their spiritual beliefs. You know, they got to keep those things active in their community because it wasn't being as harshly suppressed and it was in their memories. And the thing, though, is, is that there's still suppression. And I think this suppression had a lot to do with the formation of Congo Square that I mentioned. So you see slaves in the 18th century in uh, French and Spanish colonies, they were usually permitted to have Sundays off. Hey, you need your day to go, go to church. You know, here's your one day off. On these days, they weren't really actually permitted to go congregate in large groups you know, out of this colonial fear that if you had too many slaves in one area, they'd get together and there would be an uprising. And literally at this time in the city, for every one white person, there would be two black people. So they were really, like, very outnumbered, and they knew that. And so letting them congregate was a fear. But in the same point is people are going to do what people do, and that's, it's my day off, and we're going to get together, and they were doing it anyways. This in the end caused the mayor of New Orleans in 1817 to issue a city ordinance that restricted any kind of gathering of enslaved people outside of one location of Congo Square. So it was essentially a, screw it, we figure you're going to do it anyways. We might as well all just put you in one area where we can keep an eye on you. So here in Congo Square, this is where people were permitted to set up markets and they could sell goods. They could literally go on a Sunday and sell their own items in order to make up the money to, to buy themselves out of slavery. Or if you're already out of slavery, you're, you're in a trading market and you can make your own money and become wealthy. Um, a lot of people found that of interest. But at the same point, Congo Square was also the only place they were permitted to mingle, where they could sing and they could dance or they could play music. And this goes a lot into what we just said. So if you're not permitted to dance or sing or congregate anywhere else, how are you going to pray to your particular loa? How's he going to hear you when what you need to do to contact him is have a drum in a certain movement? So this was a place on Sunday after you got done with Mass, you can go to Congo Square and you could set up your prayers for your next saint, your next god. You know, the next person you're trying to pray to. And this is the place uh, that voodoo queen Marie Laveau would ply her trade, at least most of the year. You know, because when a, a couple times a year, she would, like many other witches or voodoo practitioners, probably end up out in the swamps doing a little more complicated, probably a little bloodier spiritual acts. But... We have to remember that we're not talking about Marie Laveau. We're talking about Julia Brown. And Julia would have definitely had the opportunity to at least see Marie's daughter, 
Marie, plying her trade, doing her practices in the 1850s. And she's getting into the religion. So if, if she could, she was probably coming out to Congo Square and being able to watch that. She may have even seen Marie Laveau herself. Who's to say that, you know, she didn't. But as she got older, Julia would earn her own title of voodoo queen as well. So she's mostly learning healing and herbal uses off Lake Pontchartrain. Pontchartrain. I cannot say this word to save my life. So anyways, so Julia went on to marry a man named Celestine Silas Brown, who was a day laborer. And according to the Find a Grave website, they would have five children, but only three of which survived. They were happy, you know, and according to a local current day voodoo queen, Bloody Mary, she says she found references to a voodoo priestess or queen with the name of Brown who worked in New Orleans in the 1860s. So this is our best chance of tracking Miss Julia Brown. So Julia and her husband would eventually move outside of New Orleans to a small village of Frenier in the St. John the Baptist Parish, back when the whole parish could only claim maybe twelve to 14,000 people total. I'm talking three towns. It's like your county size of 12,000 people. This area is a small, swampy area. It literally had no roads, but they did have a railroad, and it was very big on people hunting on their own, but it was also had a huge German community, and they were very big on farming cabbages and the dark, swampy land. And this whole area had no electricity, no phones. People's houses were probably up a story, like on stilts, just in case the flooding from the swamp. And housewives used to stand on the track and hand engineers their shopping lists of money in hopes that a few days later, those engineers could come back by with their groceries you know, delivered via train. It's literally this small of a town. And as one can imagine, in such a out-of-the-way location, there would have been probably no doctors whatsoever, nobody really to help care for the community. And this is where Julia Brown steps in. Julia may have been considered a traiteur, a folk healer. I mean, if you were, I don't know, needing mending, or you simply were sick, or you really just couldn't get to New Orleans to see a doctor, well, you were going to see Julia. And especially if you were having a baby, you saw Aunt Julia because she was the only woman in town that could help you. Now, of course, Julia's skills didn't just stop at herbal potions. In time, she also became known as the Oracle because she had a habit of predicting future events. So maybe it seems like as she's getting older, her powers are growing... But, you know, as time pushed on, you know, she's getting older and her and Silas end up gaining a 40 acre homestead. And this ends up making Julia a considerable landowner after Silas passes and she inherits the property. With her growth in age and in her wealth, many people said that Aunt Julia's demeanor also changed. She seemed to have become a little bit more bitter, a little angry. Now the oracle's no longer whispering future events, but instead she seems to really take intense pleasure in predicting tragic events to those she dislikes in order to just simply scare them. Many claim that she began to spend most of her time sitting on her front porch giving a hard evil eye to anyone that passed her property. So what's changed in Julia? Well, the rumor was that Julia was beginning to feel used and abused. If you felt hurt or sick, then you go to old Aunt Julia, and she'd come and she'd help you. But any other time, she's just suddenly starting to be seen as this spooky swamp witch, you know, someone that you avoid. You just leave her alone. Like, she's, she's feeling not appreciated for all the things that she's doing for her community. They say at this point in her life, most of her time is just spent sitting on her front porch She likes watching people go by, she strums on her guitar, and she sings her prophecies. And then she would finally give her final prophecy, and this is the song that she sang over and over again before her death. And it was something that went along the lines of, quote, One day, I'm gonna die, and I'm gonna take the whole town with me. Uh, so, she got real popular. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, in fact... A lot of people started wondering, is she really this vindictive swamp voodoo queen uh, that's really cursing the town? 
Or is she just a bitter old lady that's sitting there trying to scare the locals? Now, see, I simply like to think that she was just an older woman. She's in 1915 is about the era time we're talking. Julia is 70 years old. She's living in a swamp and she's in Louisiana. And if you don't live here in the South, I can explain what it feels like. It feels like when you step outside and try and breathe, something thick and wet tries to choke your throat. It is so hot and oppressive. And we're talking about a woman who's living with no electricity. There's no fan, no air conditioning. If there's no wind coming through that swamp, then there's nothing. So most likely this poor woman who's, again, in her 70s, is just simply hanging out on her porch trying to get herself some relief. In fact, she seems pretty spry to me if she's willing to keep playing a guitar. So, I, you know, I don't put too much, like, on Julia for hanging out on her porch. But the fact is, Julia would end up being right. And this very well might point to the fact that maybe Julia is kind of vindictive. So, Aunt Julia Brown passed away on September 28th of 1915. And word went out throughout the parish, if you wanted to give your respects to the local healer, you needed to be in for near by four o'clock for her funeral the next day. Now, again, we're talking about the South. We're talking about the early 1900s. Uh, you know, unless it's a murder that needs to go to the morgue, these bodies, they need to get put in the ground quickly, especially, you know, they're not doing procedures like we do today, you know, so that we can keep your body around for a week or so so that people can come into town and view you and set up for a funeral. In these hot, muggy areas, there's very little you can do to protect a body from starting to decay right away. The best thing you can do is just prepare the body, let everybody know, and just go ahead and and have it dealt with. So that was the plan. She passed away on the 28th, and you need to be there on the 29th by 4 o'clock. And then the day Julia was buried, that day was so oppressively hot. The wind was still... There's no leaves blowing, the birds went missing, the sky hung heavy and it's gray and there's just literally no relief. And people, they're traveling for miles to attend her funeral. Remember, miles of which there are no actual roads. It's not like you're going to get in your car and drive out there. So Julia's body, in the meanwhile, is getting prepared for burial. And she's been placed in her casket. And then that case is going to be placed in a customary wooden box before it gets sealed up and then lowered into the ground. And again, we're talking about New Orleans or if you ever talk about the area of Florida I'm from, where we have a very low um, water table. Where some areas, you're only mere feet above the water level. So it's pretty common in Louisiana for them to have above ground cemeteries because at some point everything's going to flood. And in fact, I remember growing up and people talking about door knockers. And this is when uh, it floods and then the local cemetery, the loose ground gives way to the caskets. The casket will rise and they'll literally go down the street until they hit somebody's front door, door knocker. So you can imagine that people have kind of started putting into place ways to keep this from happening. So that's where this big box comes in. So as the funeral mourners gathered to put Aunt Julia Brown into her final resting place, they realized that the weather has shifted. It's no longer just hot and oppressive. Now there is a wind, but it's picking up, and it's picking up fast. There's rain splattering the dirt. Eventually, the funeral attendees end up abandoning the funeral and rushing towards cover for any of the nearby houses. And soon, even these weren't stable enough protection. We're talking roofs lifted, buildings collapsing. So what seemed to be the vengeful wrath of Julia Brown was really the hurricane of 1915. You see, this storm had turned into a hurricane as it crossed the Caribbean Sea on September 24th. And as it gained force, it turned into a Category 4. But this wasn't something anyone in Louisiana had been told about, not back on the 24th. In fact, it wouldn't be until the 27th that the Weather Bureau actually issued a storm warning for just the East Coast, from Maine all the way to Florida. So on the 27th, the East Coast had warning. But it wouldn't be until the day Julia died on September 28th that the storm decided to bypass Jamaica, curve northwest, and was rolling through the Gulf of Mexico. 
And that's when the Weather Bureau finally issued warnings to the Louisiana coast. The coast that was actually going to be hit by this hurricane. So these messages, it's too little too late. We're talking the 28th and it's literally going to make landfall by the next day. So at least New Orleans has managed to implement a curfew, but all the areas around New Orleans were relying on mail and telegraph. And we're talking areas with no electricity, no phones, no telegraph wires. This is literally why no one had any idea of the destruction that was to come. But maybe Julia, evidently. And for those people who hadn't heard about the oncoming hurricane, there really was very little signs of anything that was coming. Yeah, the weather, it was hot. It was oppressive. But the storm surge that typically hits land, the water, the churning of the water and the waves out there, like as it's crossing over water, usually that pops up and gives you some kind of warning. But this time, it, it made very little impact before the storm ended up making landfall. In fact, um, those in New Orleans who had gotten word of the storm and had chosen to leave noted that there wasn't even an abnormal tide that morning in order to indicate that even a storm was on its way. I'm sure they got on the boats and they were like, are, are they sure? This is probably costing us a lot of money to leave. Like, they are is a hurricane really coming? But the thing is, is once the storm surge hit, water levels rose just abnormally fast. The levees flooded at the lake, and, res- and this resulted in the flooding of western New Orleans, with some areas being covered in eight feet of water. This is literally before the storm even hits. And that's just because of the levee. At the highest tide, the water reached about 15 to 20 feet high. So this hurricane officially made land as a Category 3, with gusts of wind hitting at 130 miles per hour. While some sustained winds about five minutes long, those were peaking at about 86 miles per hour. At this point in time, the French market is partially destroyed. The Masonic roof, gone. So New Orleans does start taking a beating. And Frenier, well, it became decimated as night fell. So as the wind whipped up, we're talking oil lamps near windows are going out, walls are shaking. The mourners at Julia's funeral, like we mentioned, they say that they could hear the hurricane wail that some considered to be the scream of the devil. So when that wind starts whipping up at that really high-pitched sound because it's moving just so fast, it's almost like a train whistle, that's what they're hearing at her funeral. No wonder they took off running. Next thing they know... Glass begins to break, there's debris flying around, and they're just running for any kind of cover that they can get. So townspeople ended up abandoning their homes for buildings on higher ground, and many ran for the schoolhouse, but soon even that needed to be abandoned because the water levels are rising in this swamp and the building itself begins to move. So many end up turning to boats in hopes that if they could get deep enough into the swamp, they might be able to live. They're not sure. There's really, like, the whole, all these buildings are literally falling over, roofs are flying off, and they can get into boats and barely do anything, and the wind itself is just ushering them across the water. There's really not much hope for them, except for some very brave train engineers. So a saving grace at this point in time does become train number 99 which they knew the trouble that these guys were going to be in. They knew that the railroad was actually likely to get washed out, but there was nothing else they could do than try and go help who they could. And so this big train starts going down the track, and it's just slowly going house by house and whistling in order to let people know that it was there for their rescue. But unfortunately, only a few miles in, the train ended up having to come to a stop as portions of the track had been washed away. So now here's the stranded train. There's tons of scared people stuck in the train cars as they listen to 15-foot-high waves start to crash against the side of the train cars. Eventually, water even begins to rise up through the floor of the car until people were standing in two feet of water in the train car. People knelt and they prayed for hours. It's all that they could do. In fact, one of the train crewmen, in a panic as the water ended up rising up and putting out the firebox and the engine, he decides to crawl out into the storm, and he ends up clinging to the top of the boiler and cries out, quote, Baby, I know you won't leave me. And um, he was right. (laughs) The heavy engine 
did remain true to the tracks. So he was correct that his baby would not leave him. And um, meanwhile, 50 more people had run for cover over at the Rudda train station, and they were congregated for safety to pray until the entire building blew away and they were lost the wind and the current swirling around them. So there's many stories that come out of this storm from the survivors, uh, and so many of them just speak of clinging to branches or to floating debris, to small children holding on to their siblings without knowing where their parents were. And almost all of them talk about listening to the screams and the wails of people throughout the night who were crying for help, for salvation. And there's just nothing they could do. You're simply clinging to, to trash. There's nothing you could do to help them. So the story is that only two people from Frenier survived. Uh, and one of those had already been out of town. He'd already been in New Orleans. It wasn't like he left because of the storm. And altogether, they say almost 300 people would have lost their lives from this storm, including 60 of those from this little tiny area. By October 1st, there was literally nothing left to salvage of these towns. So Julia Brown's corpse was found on Thursday, and so was the wooden box, but her casket was nowhere to be found. So most likely that storm picked and drifted her away for a while. And it did so to a lot of people who got swept up in the storm as well. And in the end, they did end up giving Julia Brown a true grave. But many of the remaining bodies that ended up being collected were said to be placed into a mass grave. So technically, Julia Brown was right. When she died, she did, in fact, take the whole town with her. But was this Julia's curse? Or did she choose to massacre the people who she spent her whole life trying to help? So some practitioners, like Bloody Mary, say no. They say Julia was a healer and an oracle, and she was simply trying to tell everyone what she saw, a mighty storm that she couldn't stop that was coming for them all. And if you want to visit Julia's grave, you can do that, technically. Uh, There are two tours out of New Orleans Uh, That'll place you on a boat, and they're going to take you through these swamps to a little high ground spot now surrounded by a wrought iron fence, a plaque that reads 1915, and some picket crosses. (laughs) They claim this is her burial right beside the mass graves. Others claim this is just a Native American midden, so an ancient trash pit. (laughs) And then some claim that this is literally nothing but a hokey gimmick to give you something to look at while you're on a tour through the swamp. But if you are truly a fan of the occult, if you're really, really brave or cocksure enough, (laughs) cock, you can check for yourself. And you can do this because you can go camp in the Manchek Swamp. You can only reach it by boat. So you got to set that up with the local uh, national park guys. But if you got a boat and you got a tent, there's nothing keeping you from exploring the swamp yourself and seeing if it, in fact, is haunted. Because right now, there are stories that say Julia has never left that swamp. And in fact, her spirit right now has been referred to as the Big Bad. And you can hear her singing through the swamps, her song, depicting the fact that, well, she was going to take the whole town with her. So, if you're brave enough, or stupid enough, why don't you go do that? And then let us know if you make it back out. We want to hear if you actually heard Aunt Julia singing to you. And that's really going to do it for me this week, you guys. I'm sorry it's a shorter episode. I hope I did okay all on my own. If I didn't, I guess you could always tell me. (laughs) But that's it. Uh, hopefully Corey will be back with us very, very soon and we can dive into spookier, scarier stuff. But until then, maybe not make the voodoo lady mad. All right, guys. See you next time. Bye.